Well, first of all, I'm very pleased to say that the doctors will see you now. I'd like to just bring onto the stage our three doctors and we'll tell you why we're going to do it. So first of all, please welcome Dr. Peter Small. Peter, welcome. <laughs> Secondly, Dr. Alexander Kumar, Alex. And Dr. David Bray, give David a big hand. So ladies and gentlemen, this is a really important session because from the world of exponential medicine and health, we're going to talk about exponential medicine and health in the world. So how about this? A disease threat anywhere is a disease threat everywhere. Would you agree with that? Of course you'd agree with that. So how about this? The world's biggest health problems, you've got a billion people that lack access to healthcare systems, 36 million deaths each year caused by non-communicable diseases, for example, cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, and chronic lung disease. And if you look at the global threats, and in 2016, over $1.7 trillion spent on global health, of which only 5% gets to patients, believe it or not. But these are some of the big global threats, cholera, malaria, diphtheria, natural disasters, mental health, nutrition, environmental change, a very big, big problem now in the wider global world. Uh, and of course, the, one of the others that's really uh, gathering momentum, it seems on a global basis, is the failure of antimicrobial drugs. So what we'd like to do is introduce you to three specialists in their various fields that can give us a very interesting view as to what goes on in the wider world, how we democratize the whole question of health. And first up, we'd like to introduce Dr. Peter Small. Peter is uh, one of the world's great, great authorities, pretty much helped to reduce and improve the world's fight against tuberculosis. Peter, you uh, just wonderful to have you here at uh, Expo Med. So let's hear from you. Thanks. It's, um yeah, I've had this uh, eclectic, some people would say chaotic life. I was a doctor and then I was a scientist and then I was a product developer. And um, that uh, makes it only more um, embarrassing to admit that this is in fact the, my first exponential medicine conference. And uh, I have to say it's completely blown my mind. The, <laughs> the, the scope and the scale of your ambitions is really inspirational. And, and it's a stark contrast to the meeting I was at which was a global health uh, meeting in Amsterdam just last week, uh, which was dominated by a bunch of bureaucratic Luddites. <laughs> so, Luddites. Um, but uh, there is one question I've had after virtually every one of the presentations that I've heard, and, and that is, what about everyone else? Uh, what about the two, the half of the world that's living on less than $2 a day, the, the billions of people living at the bottom of the pyramid. What, a, what about getting the benefits of your visions and your efforts to the people who need it the most? And, and, and that's the question I want to sort of focus on in, in the next couple of minutes. I had uh, the incredible privilege of uh, working for uh, the world's richest couple taking on some of the world's biggest challenges. And, and I would say that though that decade left me with three points that I'd like to make. Uh, design specifications, if you will, for getting your work to the people who need it. And, and the first is to collaborate. Yeah, you gotta get the AI right, but in these fragile markets, you really need to have an end-to-end -end turnkey system. And you're looking at the poorest of the poor, you're looking at uh, uh, discombobulated government interaction and service. Uh, so give us some sense of it. Well, you know, and, and I, I would say what I'm talking about is, is the people um, beyond what I've been hearing about here, which is sort of US and North America for the most part. Um, you know, just to quickly finish, Ralph, I'd say the, the, the second issue is that you need to innovate as, as, uh, as we heard yesterday, uh, you know, GM isn't going to bring you a electric car. The global health mafia will not disrupt itself. <laughs> and that's what you're going to have to do. And, and the third and the final thing is you have to move beyond your t comfort zone with technology and, and get engaged in advocacy, policy, and communication. And, and you know, the people I've met here in the last few days, you're super well suited to this. It's probably in the genome presentation that I missed. And, and that is that it's written in your DNA, you know, collaboration, communication, and um, 
and, and innovation. Um, I want to just quickly show uh, a short video about what you might experience if you follow that playbook. So if we could just cue that video. Let's with roll sound. the video. I think you guys see it every day. It's just amazing, this poor woman. I can't put myself in her head, you know? Both your siblings die, and, and for seven years you're seeking care. So for me, that was an incredibly powerful and I would say pinnacle moment. I'd met with the Dalai Lama in the morning and this was the first time that I had seen a technology that I'd played a small role in bringing to market actually saving lives. And I would propose that all of you in the audience can have that moment, that you can have impact in a different market than perhaps you're currently thinking. And in watching this conference, I feel as though there's one big challenge that, that isn't being discussed, and, and that is what is the business model that allows you to get rewarded for your work and to improve the health systems in these types of settings. And, you know, I'm confident that this is a problem that can be solved. I get a little concerned. I hear there's a confusion in the language between impact and the harsh economics of exits. So I think we have to be candid about it, I have to take it on. But this issue of what is the business model of getting your work to benefit those who need it most is, I think, a critical issue and a big focus of my, of my life these days. So Peter, one of the things that you've specialized in is situational assessment, where you go into a territory or an area, usually a very low economic performing area. You spend a lot of time in Madagascar, where you were the first to get drone deliveries of medication uh, in Ma to the Malagasy population, as they called in Madagascar. You served in India. You went there at the invitation of the Indian prime minister. You've worked in all of these really uh, uh, underprivileged uh, environments. Do you find that there is the enthusiasm from community health workers to help reinforce your work? Just give us an, uh, some sense of this notion of situational awareness and how you can bring that to a remedial uh, a positive end. Yeah, so I think there, there are different aspects of, of, of being aware of the situation. We'll hear a little bit about the, the threat awareness. I, I'm super excited now about our increasing ability to be aware of the response. And in particular, you know, this profusion of mobile phones and other, uh, the Internet of Things, which is a global phenomena, gives us a chance to actually know what is happening. What, f what community health worker's phone is leaving the bar <laughs> and getting to the patient using real event-generated data? I'm super interested in how blockchain can actually prove impact and how we can string this together. Uh, to, to make a big difference. You know, there are about, um, I think, 30, 30 million uh, gene expert tests being done a year, but we had to install an instrument base for this. This is an incredible opportunity because the instrument base for this mobile phone-based situational awareness, it's out there and it's growing by itself. So that mobile capability is obviously changing the face of implementation of all of these plans. And now that you're a Rockefeller fellow, uh, where you're continuing to look at this, 
Um, which territories are you going to give some focus to over the course of the next 12 months? Yeah, I'm pretty agnostic about the geography. I've, um, I'm focused actually on where strategically you start if you want to have an impact. You know, I, you know, Bill and Melinda are very focused on the poor and the poorest of the poor, but, but I think sometimes focusing on the richer poor is the way you actually ultimately get to improve the lives of the very poor. Right. So you were with, the, with uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for 13 years. Yeah. Uh, during that process, you saw the decline of TB on a global basis. Well, unfortunately not. You know, we <laughs> I saw the introduction of some amazing new technology. You know, sort of at the outset, what, uh, what, what Bill realized was that this was a neglected industry. It had been, uh, there had been no new drugs, diagnostics, or vaccines. We're dealing with a death every 15 seconds, and, and, the, and the frontline workers have a 100-year-old diagnostic test, an 80-year-old vaccine, drugs that haven't changed for 60 years. And, and he really opened his wallet and said, how do we flip that community? How do we create positive, uh, it, was a, it was a vicious cycle of neglect and, and failure. How do we flip that into a virtuous cycle? And I'm, I'm, I think that that's actually happened. If you look at the new drugs that are out there that can cure drug-resistant TB, 85% of the time, uh, we're looking at diagnostic texts like the Gene Expert. There's even uh, some promising results on a vaccine. Wow. So, Alex, uh, let's go to you. You've got a fascinating background. You originally trained in anesthetics and intensive care at Oxford University. Uh, you then went to the School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in London, uh, specializing in disaster medicine, mountain medicine, and expedition medicine. And you are also a physician that has now worked in over 90 countries, including the Antarctic, and working on a special project in the Antarctic to train uh, astronauts that ultimately might go to Mars. Correct. So tell us a little bit about this uh, uh, quite uh, remarkable kind of uh, world view that you have. Well, uh, nice to be here, thanks. And I'm still alive after all that, somehow. <laughs> um, I want to thank the organizers as well for having me and for being part of such a, a prestigious panel. So I thought I'd give you uh, a link between what happens on the ground uh, in terms of some of the innovations we see in, in relation to some of the clinical diseases, but also in relation to the security, which, of course, feeds on to the next speaker. So I work partly as a doctor, and when I don't enjoy clinics, I move across into photography, which is my true passion. And at the moment, I'm specialising in global health photography, so documentary photography. So working on projects with different foundations around the world, uh, trying to tease out some of the real challenges and issues and bridge the crevasse, which is there between community healthcare workers, doctors, nurses, and patients, communities, families. And that's a really interesting creative area. So, I don't know if anyone recognises this off the top of their heads, but I'm going to come back to this at the end um, to give you another uh, picture. So, um, this is from above, the same island, and I'm going to uh, te tease out this story. So, we move faster than we ever have as a species, which is very interesting, very challenging to keep up to date with threats. These are flights around the world. I think most of us have been on most of them. <laughs> So we make love fast as well. <laughs> and I say that in that the population is, is, is bulging at its seams. Um, you know, in a serious way, it, the world is growing closer together. We're more connected, more, you know, more connected with all this technology. And yet, seem, isolation seems to be so prominent with poor mental health these days. In terms of, um, we also live fast. And um, those of us that uh, you know, li live fast sometimes uh, sadly die fast. Um, our lives are becoming more and more complex in relation to uh, the speed at which we leave. Um, and our, our lives are becoming more and more complex as a result. So what's interesting is, with all this technology, information is moving faster. Governments are finding it harder from a security perspective to keep up. So um, this is a map of Facebook around the world. In fact, it's old. This is a map of Twitter, and it's old. It's when Twitter first started. With the information comes infrastructure. The blue lines you can see on the screen are uh, internet cables run across the world. So in relation to that, again, it allows us to be connected. So if I just give you an example of some of the global health security threats around the world. So there is a security agenda on global health. And in fact, it, it's really important. Cost effectiveness, inclusiveness, sustainability, partnership. These are some of the things that we should apply to technology if we're straying into the healthcare sector. 
Antimicrobial resistance, as Ralph said, is one of the biggest, greatest challenges we face. This was a patient, I took this photo in Bangladesh. This person had a drug-resistant uh, sepsis, meaning their body was overcome by infection. They died at 8 p.m. that evening. And all of these photos you'll see of patients are with permission, strict permission. So water and food scarcity as well, in terms of security, these are really important issues uh, that face all of us, but more so the developing world, so the low and middle income countries. Climate change. So, as Ralph said as well, our, our environment is changing faster and faster, and in, in all of the problems, actually, infectious diseases and outbreaks are there. This was taken on the Thai-Myanmar border, and in fact was a drug-resistant case of tuberculosis, so feeds directly into Peter's old work. Homo sapiens, and I, I like this, I took this in Ghana, which was basically, uh, you know, a play, a play on, of course, uh, on ourselves being the worst things. But I'd say this is full of exponential opportunities, this field, but we need to really be careful about what we do. That works much better. So, sustainable goals. These are the, the sustainable development goals, SDGs. I'm just going to run through these very quickly, but these are what really all of this works about. It's a new future uh, aims for all of this work. So end poverty, end hunger. I mean, huge, you know, boisterous uh, um, uh, things to attain here. Gender equality, water and sanitation. So running through them. So, you know, the main point is, is these are going towards trying to end poverty. One in eight Americans live, you know, under the poverty line. Um, and this was taken in the Philippines in a, in a, in a, in a garbage place, in a garbage uh, centre that actually collapsed down a hillside. Zero hunger. So a lot of food scarcity. Found these people in a village in uh, Nepal. They're growing rice. That's why their feet are dirty. But the happiest people you'll ever meet. Good health and well-being. So I found this in, uh, <laughs> in Asia as well. But I mean, it's how you define health, physical, social, mental, spiritual well-being. Quality education that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, among many others, has tried to push as a priority. And of course, all of this can have technology applied to it. Gender equality. So uh, I found this in Greenland, of all places. Free hugs. So uh, definitely took advantage there for free hugs. <laughs> Clean water and sanitation. I mean, it's something we just turn on a tap in, you know, in the developed world. We're so happy. But Yemen, Cape Town, are really case examples of where water scarcity, but also water quality, is, uh, is quite bad. Affordable and clean energy. You know, how can we innovate? How can we bring these, these technological advances through? Decent work and economic growth, something that you know, relates to the business model as well. And um, you know, how are we going to fit in with these, with these new technologies in terms of jobs? Innovation and infrastructure. Infrastructure lighting, for example, will change a child's life. It will change their ability to be educated and to seek other opportunities as a result. Uh, this passed me on the roadside in uh, West Africa. I loved, loved this gentleman. <laughs> Reduce inequalities and inequity, massively important in terms of um, you know, the way that uh, life really truly is for the haves and have nots. Sustainability, you know, cities and communities, most, most of us are going to be urbanized in the future. And so the big trend is people moving into cities. These cities are breaking at their seams in terms of healthcare, they're overrun. And so we have to think you know, about how technology can be used. Responsible consumption and production, meat. Climate action, so actually having some action on what's going on with climate change. Um, I think this is one of the most concerning of the, the points I listed. Life below water, what a beautiful word of, world of biodiversity that we have, absolutely amazing. Um, this passed under a boat I was in in Polynesia, um, actually doing some consult work over, over there. Life on land. Nico Preston, a colleague of mine, uh, here he is in Africa's largest slum, Kibera. A lot of people really are living in poor, poor conditions. And, uh, you know. That's in Kenya. Correct, yes. Kibera slum is in uh, Nairobi. So, actually, quite a dangerous slum in certain areas of it. And then coming towards the end, peace, justice, and strong intuitions. So, um, you know, it's how we perceive the world and ourselves and how we can move to better that. Partnerships for the goals, 
I couldn't really find a good partnership photo other than the classical teams around the world. So uh, this lady and cat in Vietnam in a market, I don't know how the cat has helped her sell this fruit, but uh, <laughs> great relationship. Clearly a, a productive one. So exponential problems need exponential people with exponential technology to provide exponential solutions. I did a global solutions program in Singularity University last year. Spent two and a half months with 90 people from 47 countries as the only doctor getting my head around what all you brilliant people do and how that can be applied to the, to the you know, developing world essentially as well as our world. So you need to put your thinking caps on. And, uh, you know, approach problems such as Zika virus and, uh, and, and the other big threats. Now, Zika virus is interesting. This is a photo I took of a mother. The knock-on effect of Zika once it disappears of leaving, you know, a, a group of children, a large group of children in Brazil without uh, mental capacity in terms of me mental um, impairment really will damage their future. Unaffordable insect repellent, 12 US dollars for insect repellent. Who can afford that? 300 US dollars for the test for Zika, which, you know, by the time you, if you want to abort your child, it's too late. So I'm now working with The Guardian, with The Lancet. I'm very privileged to uh, publish people's stories. The health providers, the stories of the health providers and patients are incredible. Dr. Raman in India, Dr. Sabo in Ethiopia fighting leprosy. Um, Tanya, a GP in England. This is a family who are mostly illiterate of what's known as travellers. I, I, you know, previously known as in the UK. In the UK, illiterate. Um, a GP in uh, Vietnam, in Ho Chi Minh City, facing one of the largest urbanisation problems ever. Um, Dr. Chavot, who worked on ageing in, in the Pacific. Dr. San, who's worked on hepatitis C and resistance across with Medicine Sans Frontieres in, in Phnom Penh in Cambodia in Asia. And Bruce, uh, my old supervisor, I went to the Arctic and did the first piece of work on HIV. He was one of my sort of su supervisors. That's with the Inuits? <coughs> Correct. So, you know, there's a whole population still living in the Arctic, previously known as Eskimo. Who'd have known? <laughs> so the conclusion, quickly. Just one thing uh, of, of your time in the Antarctic, and particularly when you worked on this for the European uh, Union and the Human Space Flight Research Program, where you're trying to understand how far human physiology and psychology can be pushed. How cold was it in the Antarctic when you were there? So I work in Celsius, apologies. Uh, it was minus 80 Celsius ambient, minus 110 Celsius uh, with wind chills. So my iPod headphones snapped, but there's no Amazon Antarctica. So uh, <laughs> that was it, I had to fix them. <laughs> Wow. So I returned to the island. This island is called Easter Island. It's out in the Pacific. Easter Island's Rapa Nui. This is a great example of where they've eaten themselves out of house and home and resources. Apparently, the story's been, you know, put together as best as we can and fought and destroyed themselves and left. I think that's a very pertinent example to you know, our, our time on Earth here and the, the, the challenges we face. So to bring it to a close, I'm sure you all recognise these. Uh, I had the privilege of going there and, and spent just one day going round and really, you know, thinking about these problems. But I'd say always, always keep a positive hat. The world is a wonderful place full of beautiful people doing meaningf meaningful things for each other. Carry on that. Give and smile and laugh. Um, I met Jeremy Farrow, who is a current director of the Wellcome Trust. Jeremy taught me one thing which I've carried absolutely everywhere, free of charge. He said, wherever you go, whatever you do, have impact. Of course, that can be negative, but hopefully it'll be positive. And uh, this is a fist bump. That's me in an Ebola suit working in West Africa in, in Sierra Leone during the Ebola outbreak. And uh, a photojournalist <laughs> caught this by chance. But that's the attitude we should all carry when we're working in these environments. So, yes, yeah, thank you very much. Wow. What a tour de force. Between the two of you, I mean, both of you are really right there on the front line doing some amazing stuff. And David, this is a wonderful segue to speak with yourself because you too are doing some amazing work. Since September of last year, you've been the executive director of the People-Centered Coalition focused on providing uh, support and expertise for community-focused projects that measurably improve people's lives using the internet. That's in addition to a wide background that you've had in assessing threats, uh, certainly in terms of bioterrorism. Give us just a short uh, precy of what you're doing with Vint Cerf, who is one of the founders of the internet. Not Sir Tim Berners-Lee, who created the World Wide Web, but Vint Cerf, Surfing USA. 
Surfing USA uh, and the entire world. So yes, so uh, the People-Centered Internet Coalition, uh, of which Vince Cerf is one of the co-founders, is really trying to address how we can use the internet to measurably improve people's lives. That obviously can include healthcare, that can include education, it can include just coexistence. And, and, and we've been doing some measurable projects, the first of which was actually uh, helping Native Americans in the United States get access to the internet, which really is only a 30% technology issue. Uh, it's how do you get comms and power to austere areas, but then also thinking about how you actually empower the community to decide how they want to use the internet. Um, and it's actually recognizing what was sort of the idea of what's called living learning communities, which is we don't have all the answers, but we empower the community to actually figure out how they want to do it. And you're going to get different answers for different groups. Um, with the People's Internet as well, it's thinking about how we can actually empower people in Puerto Rico after their hurricane. Uh, the questions about how they can also use the internet, how that would lead to rise in entrepreneurship, how that lead to rise in education, healthcare as well, and really looking towards this impressive date on December 10th. How many people know what happened 70 years ago on December 10th of this year? Now let's see if some, anyone can come up with that. Big, big day, big, big deal for the world. Nobody? 70 years ago on December 10th, we'll, so we'll be celebrating the 70th anniversary this year of the UN Declaration of Human Rights, in which, of course, healthcare is included. Now, the question I will raise to you is how many of us think we have been successful at advancing human rights to everyone around the world? If not, then we have a need to address this unfinished work ahead and thinking about how we can actually advance this. And part of what we're thinking about with the internet is maybe there may be new digital rights for us to think about. As you mentioned, my background uh, in 2000, I signed up for a little known program called the Bioterrorism Preparedness Response Program. This was with the US Centers for Disease Control. We were only 30 people and we were really there in case a really bad day ever happened in the United States. In terms of bioterrorism? Bioterrorism, yes. So that said, it had been scheduled weeks in advance for me to give a briefing on September 11th, 2001 at 9 o'clock in the morning as to what we would do technology-wise if a bad day ever occurred. 834, of course, we all know, unfortunately, the world changed. It wasn't bioterrorism as far as we knew, but we did respond by piling computers in the cars, setting up a bunker, and responding to both New York and D.C. to those tragedies. Didn't sleep for three weeks, stood down on October 1st. I ended up giving the briefing to the CIA and the FBI on October 3rd came back to the Centers of Disease Control on October 4th, and we were then told the first case of anthrax had showed up in Florida. I initially wow. thought they were joking. I said, you're pulling my leg, and they're like, no, we're serious. Obviously, it was a very busy time for all of us um, in 2001, dealing with the responses there. That said, later we had, of course, West Nile. We had severe acute respiratory syndrome. We had monkeypox. We had some rice attacks that you may or not have heard about that also happened at the same time. And at a certain point in time, you have to wonder, like, what type of world requires me to be in the business of bioterrorism preparedness and response? And what you, well, at least the answer I came to is, human beings do wonderful things, we do mediocre things, and we also do less than great things, too. That's, that's who we are as a species. And in fact, some of those traits that we have stem back to how evolution through natural selection pressures have picked for certain traits that were well adapted when it was either us living a nomadic lifestyle or a lifestyle in which it was only 80 of us and we were mainly close family members. For most of the history of our species, we lived in where you only came across 80 people in your entire lifespan and they were your immediate family members. It was rare to come across anybody else that was different. Obviously, in the last 2,000, 3,000 years, that's been a change, but that's relatively short relative to the evolution of our species. And so we are maladapted for this world in which we're going to live in urban areas that are 10 million or more people. We're maladapted for a world in which we're going from 7.6 billion people on the planet to 8 billion people on the planet in less than four years. We have to figure out how we can build empathy towards the entire planet as a species. And that gets to the questions about us versus them demographics, the fact that can we actually do that? And so with the people-centered internet, it's trying to figure out how we can make that internet a force for good to try and uplift everybody, but also at the same time recognize that as we democratize technologies, specifically in the healthcare arena, I'm looking forward to what personalized medicine can do, but personalized medicine can also be personalized poison. And are we prepared for that? Are we prepared for the institutions that will detect that? Are we prepared for disruptions that will occur? And the final thought that I'll leave you with we may be living in the middle of history in which we are transitioning from organizing by geography to organizing by networks. 
Now, what do I mean by that? Well, when you organize by geography, there's a bell curve of what the beliefs are in that area. You may not like where the median falls, but there's at least a bell curve, and there's extremes on either side. However, when you begin to organize by networks, which is what the internet allows us to do, what the web allows us to do, what social media allows us to do, the challenge is, is when like begins to form with like, you get the reverse of a bell curve. You get an amplification of the extremes and the loss of the middle. And so we may be living in this era in which we're trying to figure out: Can we coexist as pluralistic, open societies in this rapidly changing world that's moving from geography to networks? And if so, how do we bring the rest of the world along, not just for healthcare, but for education, for well-being, and everything else? So, David, do you think that health and digital technologies can bring this together, provide some measure of optimism, get governments to take that particular responsibility, and see this actually being carried out as a Functional process that goes beyond the borders of the United States, and really gets the United States back into a much more globally responsible position of saying we will help spread the uh, a good contagion. So that's a great question. Do I think clearly technology can? But I will say again, it's probably less about the technology; it's more about the people and how you bring people together.、Um, and I would not necessarily turn to just government doing that. Uh, I do think, for the developed world, the further we get away from World War II, the more we are pulling ourselves apart. We have lost that specter that says, "Look, we may disagree on these fringes of this political belief or this political belief, but we all agree we don't want another world war." I think we've lost that, and in the end, we're pulling ourselves apart. Uh, it's become—it's a shift from a culture of we to becoming a culture of me, which may be amplified by technology. Which is, if you don't think as I do. Then I'm not going to talk to you. You mean selfies rather than weefies?、Uh, something like that, and also just we've we've lost the perspective. How can technology amplify communities versus just empower the individual? And so, while certainly there that can happen, I don't want to be too pessimistic. I'm generally an optimistic at heart. I think it's going to take all of us in the room to recognize we are the cavalry. Nobody else is coming. If we don't step up, don't be surprised if five or ten years from now we look back at it and things are worse off as opposed to better off. Because if we don't step up, I'm not sure anyone else will. And and that's something to think about. Well, hopefully this is being live streamed directly into Washington D.C. into the State Department.、Oh, but you give too much credit. That's just it. I don't. I mean, and I say this as one who has served in public service and has also been in the private sector. We should not hinge our hopes on that. If we do, then woe be it unto us. Because I think, if anything, this is an era in which we have learned helplessness, in which it's, it is we have learned that it is okay to be angry and rail and be frustrated and think that just by getting angry we solve something. That does nothing other than it just creates more anger. But what we really need to do is actually stop having learned helplessness and actually say, "Wait, if nobody else steps forward and does something, don't be surprised if anyone else does." And I point out one of the things I like to say to people is we need to distinguish between management and leadership. Management is when you meet expectations, whether they be from your boss, your patients, your reports, your peers, the public. To some degree, we have to meet expectations. But in this era of exponential change that everyone's pointed out, if all we do is meet expectations, we're going to fall further behind. And there are times when those expectations are wrong. That gets to leadership. Leadership comes from the Greek word "lead," some say, and actually it means to be sent unto death. And you might say, well, what does that have to do with leadership? Well, back in ancient Greece, the ones that carried the flag in front of the army were called the leets, and that's all well and good until one army meets another army, and who's the first to die? The leets, the flag bearers. So we have to be willing to risk things. We have to be willing to risk getting either mud thrown our way, or ridicule, or people saying it's never going to work, that's impossible, or even asking, why are you doing that? If we believe in the world in which we are uplifting everyone, if we don't step forward and do that, Even if that means we're going to have people that are going to shun it in the wrong light, or people are going to split in political dimensions, or it's going to challenge the existing, like you said, pharma mafia. If we don't step forward and do that, no one else is. It has to be us. So, Peter, just distilling some of these very potent comments by a considerable trio, including yourself, what's your take on this? What do you think of what David said? What do you think of what Alex has said? And how does this chime into your wider thinking about? What you're doing now with the Rockefeller Foundation? 
Well, I, I think these guys have done a great job of, of, of giving different perspectives on a global situation which is incredibly complicated and in a very short period of time. I, I think trying to, to bring it back focusing on what this audience can and, and I would argue must <laughs> do is, is, is to get involved and I totally, uh, I'm, I'm blown away by how much of what you are talking about in terms of patient empowerment, disintermediation, uh, you know, th pretty much all of the topics are super relevant to all these people in these pictures and 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 i i just would you know i'm i'm calm i'm very conscious conscious of how perspectives on problems create frameworks for their solutions and and i i think that that what i would love for people to try and find a way to do is to expand your perspective beyond your current addressable market and to think more about what would be a framework in which your considerable potential can be realized for all of these people who've been streaming by us. So that's all very well if you're living in San Diego or in Moose Droppings, Idaho. How do you do this on a global basis? And that really is part of the question. I guess, David, you'd raise that. Uh, sometimes you feel powerless here in the United States when you think of poverty in Bangladesh or some other something on going on in, say, uh, Uzbekistan. What, what would you say to that? I'm Alex? that to Alex. Well, I think there's obviously a difference uh, from the top layer of politics and other things um, internationally um, through all the different organizations that exist, such as the WHO, such as the IFRC, that's the International Federation Red, Red Cross Red Crescent, through to the large NGOs that are working in the health space, through to then companies that are exerting pressure on local populations or on the government. So looking at a top way down, uh, all the way to the bottom of the individual sat in that hut in that village, at the end of the village, it'll be the last person in, the, in that village that you know, needs the most help that will be at the very back. It's, it's, it's really hard, but the, you know, the, the thing that excites me the most about sitting on this panel and hearing everything I've heard in the last few days is actually you know, the true potential of what you all do, of collaboration, of partnership. The power is, is with you, the people, with us, you know, to build upon that. As John Lennon said, power to the people, but we, we don't know we're holding the power, but really um, the, these technologies can be expanded. So. So David, if, I, if someone says to you, you're an optimist, the future's so bright, you've got to wear shades, true or false? It can be, but I think what you're realizing is the future is a reflection of humanity. And we've got to look inwards and recognize that we can do amazing things, we can do mundane things, we can do cat videos, and we can do less than good things. That empathy towards the human species, I think, is what's missing from the conversation. When you ask about what can we do, whether you do something in your hometown, whether you do something locally, whether you do something globally, I would say we, we should not assume that the, the work is done here yet in Canada or the United States. There are, there are native tribe populations in Canada that could benefit from healthcare. There's rural parts of the country that could benefit from healthcare. Uh, the Southeast, Mississippi, Alabama. What I would love to see is we begin to bridge what right now is seen as the coast, east and west coast, with the heartland. Because if we don't bridge that here in the United States, then we are divided as a nation and we are less effective in terms of what we want to do for the world. And that's hard because that requires us to go to places where we may not necessarily feel like we fit in or we necessarily speak the, you know, I won't say speak the language, but it's, it's we understand the empathy in which you're coming. But I'm going to use, and, and actually I believe it was actually a very famous fictitious person, Albus Dumbledore uh, from Harry Potter, who said, we are only as strong as we are united, we are only weak as we are divided. My question is, can we use efforts to try and improve and democratize healthcare and the technologies that support that to help bring people together and make us more united as opposed to pulling us apart? Well, that's, what do you think? So in this interesting uh, journey through all of this possibility, good, bad, indifferent, uh, final closing comment from yourself. Do uh, you think uh, the Expo Med community should now think more globally? I, I, I think that Vinod hit the nail on the head when he said, you're, 
you have to disrupt from the outside. And you're all outsiders. Most of you are outsiders to global health. You're the ones we have to get engaged if we're going to see dis disruptive change. Alex. Go out and do it. Collaborate and get it done. Just do it. David, you've got the last word. So President Lincoln said, I do not like that man. I must get to know him better. What this means for <coughs> this is we need to practice disruption, but if I could amend it and say empathetic disruption. Understand and work with the communities that you are working with. Well, well. well, ladies and gentlemen, what a great, great session. Peter, Alex, David, thank you so much. And Daniel, Dr. Kraft. Thank you all. Thanks, Dr. Guys. Feelgood. Thank you. Thank you.